Okay, um, yeah, okay. I, I didn't expect the screen to be so big. Um, so uh, forgive the size of this, uh, of the text that will keep coming once in a while. Uh, like uh, Parmesh said, I'm an architect. I teach at the Kamla Reheja School of Architecture, which is in Juhu. Uh, so these are journeys I take every day. I live right at the top of those two black lines uh, in Borivli and I've uh, grown up there. Uh, so I've lived there for now almost 40 years. Um, and uh, those are two roads that I drive down every day. One is the Western Express Highway and the other one is uh, the new Andheri Link Road, Andheri Daisal Link Road. So um, I keep a blog and uh, the reason why I started the blog was because I was watching these two roads change every day, every minute, every, every day something new was happening and it was, you know, in a sense, I had the anxiety of something that's perpetually changing and I'm not able to understand what's going on. So I decided I'll keep a blog about it and begin to kind of note uh, what was happening. It wasn't a, such a kind of self-conscious thing when I think about it, but it ended up being a space where I, uh, where, where I collected fragments of my everyday life in that sense. So in a sense, it became like a history of those two roads over the past, I think, six years now. Um, anyway, these two roads got uh, developed. Actually, they, they, they are currently still being kind of built and as they will continue to be built uh, over the next 10 years or so or even more than that. Uh, but the most dramatic transformation started occurring around five years back when these new roads started coming in and old industrial areas started getting transformed into malls and multiplexes and uh, uh, you know fancy residential areas. Uh, mangroves were being kind of reclaimed, slums were being cut in through, old villages were transforming, all of that stuff was happening. So. Uh, I, uh, so those were things that kind of interested me. So today what I'm going to be doing actually is I'm going to be taking you through some of those uh, images and some of those uh, spaces. And also I'll be talking about uh, one project of sorts that we do, that we did in the school. I'm just uh, trying to draw a connection between them. Uh, but this is effectively the Western Express Highway. And uh, the entire emphasis of the road is movement. So there's this idea of lubrication of both sides. Removed, uh, sliced uh, into, and uh, uh, there was this idea that there was no waiting on this. Any kind of stability or stillness in the space was was very quickly kind of discarded, and it was about perpetual movement. And what came in its place was this, uh, you know, I mean, these fancy malls with their uh, fancy or not really kind of tacky malls with their, you know, uh, aluminium-clad facades and their billboards advertising films and. And a kind of glittering no uh, you know, that we all know a kind of a mall landscape is about. <coughs> and uh, at the same time, there was this kind of separation from the world. This is an ad of a builder. Why go out when there's a multiplex inside? Why go out when there's, you know, the entire world is effectively removed from the world, city and is kind of kept within, within. And of course, you have a cool yuppie couple going, you know, <laughs> making happy faces. Um, and you have this, which is another, this is also an ad of a developer and it's very interesting that most of the exclusive amenities concern removal from the city. Multi-level car parking, internet driving, multi-security checks, video phones, access control via proximity cards, CCTV cameras and intercom systems, boom barriers and emergency search lights, emergency search lights in the middle of Bombay. So, and a public address system, just so that Big Brother can get to you, uh, wherever you are. So. Uh, there was, while there was this kind of mad separation, within there was this dazzling kind of, I don't know, somewhere from Las Vegas. Weird future being kind of, uh, kind of contained within the walls of this, of, of, of these spaces. And at the base of that was history. Um, you know, a little kind of hut and cardboard uh, with barley paintings on it, you know, and a thatched roof. Uh, so like schizophrenia between what is the future, what is the past, you know, all of these things made into image, signs and collected together to make this kind of completely strange space. Um, and this one, which is one of my favorites, which is Kefi Azmi Park, where there are one-way signs in a park that say, walk this way, turn this way. If you walk the other way, there's actually a watchman there who stands and says, nine, nine. interesting for me because uh, it was a way in which space was being articulated uh, and I was also interested in the way landscape was being used as a weapon. Uh, this is Hiranandani complex and somewhere at the base of that 
of one of these skyscrapers, you'll see a little slum. Uh, what is interesting is that though I'm, I'm on top and I can see it. Uh, from I'm seeing it from one of the fancy high rises. Uh, but if I walk down there, there's a lawn that covers it. So from the eye level of the car, you only see lawn. And right behind it, there's a slum. So landscape itself is part of that entire kind of discourse of removal. Uh, landscape becomes lawn, uh, somewhere from Switzerland or something. Uh, so, but all of them, for me, collapsed together in this incredible space called mind space. You know, mind space, think about that. Complete removal from everything outside, inside your head. Hmm? And if you look at this image, this is, uh, I don't know how many of you all know, this is Inorbit Mall. Uh, and uh, that entire area around it, which was once a garbage dump. Uh, one of the biggest garbage dumps in the city and was a garbage dump for a very long time until local residents uh, you know, complained about the smell. And uh, you know, what do you do when local residents complain about uh, the smell? You say, move the garbage dump out and let's build housing and malls on that land. So the proposal was simple. We'll you know, put uh, some lawn on top of one big dump, uh, 30 feet of dump, and you know, pretend it's a park. And, and towards the edge of the water, I don't know, I wish I had a pointer. But uh, if you look at the uh, left extreme, uh, you have that, uh, like another big garden that uh, separates the creek uh, from mind space. Um, so I'll be going a little bit, I'll be looking at a little at mind space and the two gardens actually within mind space a little bit right now. And this is mind space. Again, it's classic. There is absolutely nobody on the streets and there's no reason to be there. Except at night, you know, when it all gets dark and you can take your car there and, you know, with your girlfriend or boyfriend, you can have some fun. Uh, but otherwise, there's nobody on the roads. In fact, if you go there during the middle of the day and you stand on the street, there's a kind of a guard every almost 200, 300 meters who tells you to keep moving. So you're asked to continue to move. Please, you're not allowed to stay. Um, and instead, you have these lawns, um, lawn, uh, these gardens, lawns, planters, dividers uh, that separate movement completely and uh, keep you constantly uh, moving. So, uh, or you have this, which is uh, pots uh, on the steps of the main uh, of one of the main gardens, um, and these steps, these pots are placed obviously so that you can't sit there. Um, so there are steps, wide, inviting steps that have been placed there, and you're not allowed, you're not allowed to effectively wait there. Um, this is inside that garden, uh, which is towards the uh, you know the one towards the creek, uh, where I was told by the watchman who was the only man there in the middle of the day. Uh, that, uh, you know, these plants have been imported from Thailand, sir. I was like, yeah, thank you so much. But uh, that's effectively, and, and, and this is on top of the, okay, right behind in Orbit Mall, there's a big mound. That mound has garbage underneath it, lots of it. It's 30 foot high, and there's turf that's been placed on all, on, on all, on all sides. Uh, it was, I think, three years back that uh, the, you know, they're, they're basically call centers around this, in this whole, or in this whole space. It was around three years back that there were articles in the newspaper suddenly that said that the computers in MindSpace were, you know, effectively going bad much faster than any other place because of the um, pollution in the air. And all that pollution came from the fact that there was kind of leachant or some kind of gases, noxious gases, uh, released from underneath this uh, garbage dump. But on top of the garbage dump, you don't see that. It's a children's play area, uh, but there is not that many children around. Uh, uh, there's a gardener who takes care of it. He comes and waters the plant every day. You're not allowed in, by the way. We had to really fight to get in uh, inside this uh, particular compound. Uh, and uh, you know, he takes care of this of this garden, lawns again, and you have a watchman. And this watchman spends the whole day hanging around here. He's the only one who actually uses uh, this garden. <laughs> the other people who might be able to see that garden, uh, I mean, oh sorry, before that. And um, yes, there's a, and, and actually it's interesting for me because one of my favorite films from last year, Robot, with Rajnikanth, sorry, uh, uh, was, there was a very important part that was shot there. And somehow it kind of, this, the space has this kind of space of artifice and kind of strange cyborg-like beings, you know, this is perfect for it. And the sequence is this, where uh, Rajnikanth, who's a robot, is running out of power. So he staggers on the street with Aishwarya Rai and uh, walks up to a guy who's driving his car and stops him, shoots him with his finger, and uh, effectively, you know, recharges himself. <laughs> um, but inside those spaces, this is from John and Jane by Oshim Mahluwalia. Getting inside the call centers is almost impossible. Taking photographs in there is even more impossible. 
So this is a kind of taken from Ocean's film, which is a very nice film on call center. Um, and, and, it's, and it actually goes within the spaces uh, of these really strange kind of, uh, um, kind of uh, buildings. And if you look at the, and in, and in these buildings, you're never allowed to look out. So you have these glass facades on all sides, and you can't look out of those glass facades. Because looking out would change your time-space coordinates. And since you're speaking to somebody in some other place, you know, you're supposed to kind of effectively live in that space. Which is why, you know, you have this, which is 345. You're living in that time, and you're living in that space. Uh, and your, uh, your entire being is being constructed. Uh, this is a training program, same from the same film. Which one do you think has more variety, India or America? And the answer is obviously America. And you're being effectively conditioned. You're conditioned to become this other person who lives in this, uh, you know, other space. Um, uh, you you watch JFK videos in their auditorium and kind of get yourself get 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 your kind of fix of American history and American weather, everything actually, and uh, you become a superhero. Uh, because this is uh, this is what is uh, this is effectively on you know those buses that take the call center workers from one place to the other. This is on it, and that uh, the addition of that mic mic thing, okay, that effectively makes you uh, part human, part cyborg, uh, part sorry machine, and uh, again robot. Uh, and it's interesting because the end sequence of robot, uh, which is wild half hour of incredible fun is when like all these call center workers almost uh, becomes these strange objects three dimensional objects that kind of begin to take over the world uh, becomes spheres becomes walls becomes carpets becomes cylinders becomes screws becomes snakes and then becomes a man and then kind of runs along and kind of moves out of mind space to really scare us all to death uh, uh, but uh, so uh, this landscape of kind of where the artificial and the natural and all of these things come together is was was kind of interesting for me to kind of look at especially in robot but directly outside mind space now this is the boundary of mind space this is the northern edge of mind, mind space and this is where the labor effectively live um, and um, you know they live in a slum with no infrastructure obviously water is coming in but there was a movement by some of the mind space workers to move this slum away uh, because the reflection of the slum on the glass facade wasn't very attractive. Uh, then there's the other edge, which is the, su the southern edge of mind space, which is you know the connection to the local community, Bangur Nagar, which is an underbuilt road. Uh, this is the edge to the creek, besides the garden, this is the other edge, which is a wall. And uh, through the wall, there are these kinds of cracks that open up, and you can see the fishermen fishing in the creek sometimes. Um, and the other edge is this, which is, you know, nature, um, in some strange way, uh, painted. And, uh, and, 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 and uh, I'm moving away from my space uh, for some time. Uh, and then what's happening is that these, so all of these is creating a kind of landscape of these huge infrastructures that are breaking into old, old kind of systems, uh, taking over uh, slum areas, kind of um, Gauthans, Gauthans are old villages, all of these spaces. Uh, older buildings are being replaced co continuously and constantly. Nothing is old, nothing is kind of sacred. Everything is in a perpetual state of movement because of the speculative kind of space that, I mean, Rahul and Mata spoke of. Uh, and that obviously includes slums, which uh, lie fragmented like that, you know, and they become like public spaces. Everything that is left over, the fragment, the residue, uh, become space that we kind of begin to include uh, within the public sphere. And that was kind of interesting for me because that leads to this uh, a way in which tactical maneuvers through everyday life begin to claim space in the city. Uh, this is a barber shop uh, that existed for I think for a month. While they're sitting on a road divider under construction, uh, a road is under construction and a road divider was made. So a barber shop is set up at that time and that space only for that period of time. It's like that, that's the road behind and that's the slum that was cut into. <coughs> or, you know, it also further down the road it became a market, uh, like a market that was selling fish. Uh, then you have uh, chandeliers that are being, being sold directly opposite a mall. So there are ways in which everyday life tends to make space, make space through performing, through kind of claiming space, through their own bodies, through, through the making of kind of temporary uh, tactics, um, as it were. <coughs> Uh, you know, it's a, this is his bed every day. Every day I have seen him on the flyover uh, sleeping, uh, except in the rains. And 
public space again and cricket of course uh, a space a way to kind of begin to uh, claim space for that particular type of time, for that particular time uh, but as an architect now i mean you know i'm an architect after all, i have to kind of intervene i was interested in these uh, which are the languages uh, that uh, that are developed uh, to deal with this perpetually shifting city uh, this is uh, you know a visual language that when you're driving on the road you know that a tire guy is there who can you know get your puncture repaired or whatever so these are languages that are evolved they are kind of they, they don't emerge from any kind of particular logic uh, they they evolve through a kind of assemblage of things at hand um, and as an architect i was interested to kind of understand what those languages are and how does one begin to uh, work with them how do they give new ways of reading um, a city because the city otherwise is uh, you know made of unexpected collisions we don't know what's happening things are coming together that we just cannot for the life of us make any sense of uh, like this you know which is a school that i that i've seen almost every day except in the rains which happens on the pavement with uniforms with blackboards and with teachers um, or this which is actually an sra building that is part uh, a hotel and part a slum you know and just two sides of the same building and they pretend that they don't know each other uh, you know so it's very kind of odd it's completely schizophrenic kind of existence uh, between uh, between all of these or you have the completely assembled and this is from dharavi where a truck has been taken and turned into a storage home all kinds of things together by cutting it and pasting it in some new kind of formation or just the completely nonsensical like you're driving down the road one day and there's a jeep on fire and you have no idea what to make of it there's no reason it just comes out of nowhere and there are many such instances where the completely uh, i don't know what i can think of as random kinds of things appear in the city and in a day in the city you kind of get to see all of these together and as an architect who you know we love clarity uh, and you know we get a lot of flack for that as well uh, we trying to figure out you know in terms of how does one read the city how does one begin to understand the city and uh, i'm very quickly going to kind of end with talking about one of the processes that we play with in the school that i teach in which is the kamla raja school which is to uh, play with the idea of uh, uh, the random actually the unexpected collision between things that reveals a new way of seeing uh, because very often ways of seeing are embedded in certain forms of knowledge and uh, sometimes to challenge that form of knowledge you have to kind of just kind of shuffle everything so maybe a new way is seen like this what you're seeing on the right side is an exquisite corpse uh, an exquisite corpse is a surrealist game where different people contribute different things and those are all put together to form one narrative and that perhaps can be a way of understanding or understanding uh, uh, a city but uh, i'm not going to be talking about the uh, exquisite corpse but we're talking about the cyborg uh, what we did in the cyborg is we made three kind of compartments in one compartment we placed natural things lots of natural things uh, you know trees and frogs and all kinds of things in the other compartment we placed a lot of designed stuff like knives and uh, in this case a light bulb etc etc and in the third we placed uh, sites in the city just sites in the city and then a uh, student was asked to randomly pick three three of them and then you got like narratives like in this case you got a narrative of a locust a light bulb and a and an sra scheme she just happened to get it and then she had to figure out you know what is it that she could find that connected all of these three things together it took us took some time and some very and uh, she went to the sra and the sra i don't know if you all have ever been inside one it's a labyrinth of dark corridors leading three dimensionally to nothing that your entire sense of space is completely lost and it's completely dark completely dark and you can't really look you can't see except the light at the end of the tunnel um, and so what she did she got her locust to eat the building the locust came and ate the whole building through um, and as, as she ate as the locust ate the building it kind of kept kind of making holes as it kind of worked its way through the building and came out from the other end and as it made and it, as it did that it created spaces spaces within the three dimensional labyrinth of the of the of the, of the sra and created spaces where you know some kind of public activity could start taking place and that became her project as it were so her project effectively took the sra building and kind of cut it out cut it out to create light spaces spaces of interaction and move through it was also a reaction against the fact that within an sra building there is no public space all public space is that corridor that goes from one end to the other that lab or that staircase that goes down that ends up being a garbage dump um 
another i mean this is just a close up of that same um, of that of her kind of project that was then inserted into an sri so similarly we tried we tried different kinds of things once we played with tarot cards once we played with uh, kind of other 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 such i guess devices uh, to reveal new ways of seeing uh, but i'm just going to go end now with just looking at two or three of them which is this is when the ginger met the ice cube tray at mandapeshwar caves um, this is what happened when the centipede met the knife at juhu market um this is what happened when the cotton pod met a zipper at bohra bazaar uh, this is what happened when ivy met a pot at uh, edward theater but so this is just like it just throws out new kinds of ideas of form new ideas of validity new 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 methods of kind of intervening within the city thank you